1 Thessalonians 5, 16. And uh, I'll read from that momentarily. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. I hope it's still in my Bible. All right, found it. Thanksgiving is a federal holiday in the United States. It's celebrated every year on the fourth Sunday, the fourth Thursday of November. And uh, it originated as a day of Thanksgiving, a harvest festival, and the theme is giving thanks. The event that Americans commonly refer to as the first Thanksgiving was celebrated by the pilgrims. I learned about them when I was a little boy. After their first harvest in the new world, that was in 1621, I believe there were 90 Native Americans and 53 survivors of the Mayflower that had come over with the pilgrims. And then George Washington. Thanksgiving was celebrated starting in 1789 with a proclamation from him as president after it was requested by Congress. And then later on, the celebration of Thanksgiving was sporadic, but right in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, when he was president, proclaimed a national day of Thanksgiving and praise, and I'm quoting Abraham Lincoln, who was a wordsmith. Thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens, calling on the American people to also with humble penitence for our national perverseness, that's our sins, and disobedience, fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation. Don and I watched a documentary on Abraham Lincoln just the other night. What a great man he was. And then in 1942, right in the middle of World War II, by an act of Congress, Thanksgiving received a permanent observation date, the fourth Thursday in November. I know that God is not an American, but I tell you, in America, we've got a lot to be thankful for. I've not been all over the world, but I've been to enough countries to know that we are very blessed by the Lord. And we ought to thank God every day for our nation. Even though it's not perfect, neither are we, but we should be thankful for all of our blessings. But more than that, more than Americans, we as Christians have so much to be thankful for. So on this Sunday prior to Thanksgiving Day, I want us to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 19. And these scriptures speak volumes about being thankful to the Lord. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Father, develop within every person in this room a spirit of thankfulness. Oh God in heaven, I pray that we will be thankful for all that you have done for us in Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. amen. Being thankful to Jesus is indeed, the title of my message is, being thankful is God's will for every Christian. God's will for every Christian. I want us to read together it's a very short text, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. Read it with me, please. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Let's talk about God's will for every Christian. You know, I have people all the time. How do you know the will of God? Well, you don't have to worry about this text. This is telling you that all of these things are the will of God. It is God's will for you to rejoice always, God's will for you to pray without ceasing, God's will in everything to give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. And if you'll do that, you won't quench or snuff out 
or stop the flow and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. First of all, it's God's will for every Christian to rejoice constantly. To rejoice constantly. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word rejoice is the Greek word kairo, and it means to be glad, to be delighted. To rejoice is to celebrate, to cheer. I married a cheerleader, and uh, Donna is a cheerful person. To exalt, to delight. When a Christian rejoices, he celebrates the many blessings that God has given to us, especially those blessings that are in Christ. He applauds God's forgiveness of his sins. And when a Christian rejoices, he delights in God's providential care. Aren't you glad that God takes care of all of our needs in Christ Jesus? Christians should not be gloomy and doomy all the time. We should not foster a pessimistic attitude. Don't count your problems. Count your blessings. And if you focus on the difficulties and tribulations, you're saying to God, I don't appreciate how good you have been to me, all that you've done for me. You can either be cheerful or you can be grumpy. You can be positive or you can be negative. You can be grateful or you can lack appreciation for what God has done. You can be pessimistic or you can be optimistic. A worry wart are a rejoicing believer in Jesus Christ. Now, you guys have been with me. I'm, this is my 19th year here. You've heard all my stories. But my favorite story connected to this part was a lady that came to my office. I was 25 years old. I had just started being a pastor. And I thought everything was going pretty well in the church. We were seeing people saved, people getting baptized, people joining the church. Congregation had a sweet spirit. Offerings were good. Budget needs were being met. Missions was good. I mean, it was just things were going great. And so I was surprised. The lady asked if she could talk to me prior to the service. You know, I never do that anymore. my knowledge, this is the only time I've done that in my life. Uh, it's not good for a preacher to have somebody come in with a bad attitude right before he goes out to preach. And she sat down in my office and she started systematically pointing out everything that she saw wrong in our congregation. It blew my mind. I was astounded. She went on and on and on. She had a notebook and she was reading from it. And after a while, I was like Popeye. It had all as I could stand. I couldn't stand no more. <laughs> and I said, uh, excuse me, ma'am. I want to reply to your complaints. Our church isn't perfect. And one of the reasons is because I'm the pastor. But I fail to see all the bad in our church that you see. And I think I know the problem. She said, well, what is it? I said, I think you're looking for a perfect church. And I can tell you that there's no such thing as a perfect church. But in case you find a perfect church, please don't join it. <laughs> and she didn't get it. She said, well, why not? I said, because if you join a perfect church, <laughs> it will no longer be perfect. <laughs> because you'll be a part of it and you are not perfect. And then I said, as a 25 year old pastor, I said, you have been embraced and given into a critical spirit. She stared at me for a minute. 
I had no idea what she was about to say. She said, preacher, you're right. God is my witness. She said, preacher, you're right. I do have a critical spirit. My family says I do, and so do my friends. We prayed, and she stopped nitpicking, and she stayed in our church for several years until we left, and she was a good church member. Criticism, it takes no size, Dr. Rogers said, to criticize. Anybody can find fault. And when you criticize somebody, that doesn't make you better than them. It makes you worse than them. You can go around looking for the bad and you'll find it. Or you can rejoice always. Rejoice always. I love Habakkuk. You got to know how to spell that when you get to heaven, by the way. The little Jewish guy comes up to you and he says, how do you, how'd you like my book? Well, who are you? I'm Habakkuk. You better know this book. All right. Habakkuk 3, 17 through 18, though the fig tree should not blossom. And there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of olive oil should fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and the cattle, no cattle in the stalls. Yet I will, say it with me, exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Let's give Him praise right now. Just give God praise right now. Amen. Something about rejoicing. Psalm 85, verse 6, will you not yourself revive us again, Lord, that your people may rejoice in you? Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. James 1, 2 through 4, consider it all joy. My brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Are you a joyful person? Do you have the joy of the Lord in your soul? When you come into a room, what do you leave behind when you leave the room? Do you leave leave tension? Do you leave anger? Or do you leave love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? Some of you are weak because you don't rejoice. Now, I don't just stare at anybody much while we're singing. I'm talking to the Lord and singing, but I know that some of you never sing when you come in here. You say, well, I don't know the music. Well, it's right up there on the screen. Well, I'm not used to it. Well, learn something new. And sing it with all your heart. And then we'll have a great hymn come by. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. It's all good. I said it's all good. It's all biblical. Don't be nitpicky. Don't be critical. Don't be judgmental. No one enjoys being around people like that. Bellevue, I can hear Paul, who was, nobody suffered more than Paul except Jesus. And Paul says, Rejoice constantly. Secondly, it's God's will for every Christian to pray continuously. Pray continuously. He says in verse 17, and by the way, if you, these are some really short verses. If you're looking for some great verses to memorize, it won't take you long. 
just a thought. Pray without ceasing. Say it with me. Pray without ceasing. He says, pray a lot. Don't just say a little prayer in the morning. Used to be a song. I say a little prayer for you. I don't want anybody saying a little prayer for me. I want to pray a big prayer for me. Go to bed on time. Get up on time. Spend time with the Lord. Start every day reading the Word of God and praying. Before you pick up your iPhone, read your Bible and pray. Before you check your emails, read your Bible and pray. It's more important what God says and what you say to God than what man has to say to you. God is more important than your job. God is more important than your family. Go to bed on time. Get up on time. If you've got children, you've got to really go to bed on time. And I'm telling you, even if you don't get a lot of sleep, get up on time to spend time with the Lord. You'll be a better father. You'll be a better mother. You'll be a better spouse, better grandparent. Pray in the morning. Pray throughout the day. Pray before you go to bed. That's three times a day. Daniel did it. And even though his enemies outlawed prayer, he still prayed. Daniel 6.10 says, when Daniel knew that the document was signed and they were making prayer illegal, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. God listened to his prayers. He lived to be almost 90 years old. He was made a eunuch when he was a boy. He was a prisoner. His parents had been killed. He never lived in Jerusalem again, but he could get hold of the God of Israel because he knew how to pray. God protected him, threw him in the lion's den, and the angel went with him. I'd rather be in the lion's den with the angel than outside without the angel. And his accusers got thrown in, and guess what? They didn't have an angel. And I'll let you figure out what happened to them. Every prayer is a heavenly investment. Think about it that way. You're putting treasure in heaven when you pray. You say, where in the world did you get that? Out of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. When he had taken, when God had taken the book, the four living creatures and the, living, and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Your prayers turn into incense that burn before the throne of God forever and ever and ever. You go on reading Three chapters later in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 through 4, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. Read verse 4 with me, please, out loud, good and strong. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Every time you bow and pray, every time you close your heart, your eyes, and you lift up your heart toward the Lord, and you cry out to God, I'm telling you, it is incense. You can't see it, but God loves it, and He holds it in His heavenly hand. Get a lot of incense going up there. Pray without ceasing. Isaiah 40, 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. If you're weak, wait for the Lord. That's prayer. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired. They'll walk and not become weary. Luke 18, 1. Now Jesus was telling them a parable to show that at all times. Everybody say all times. That at all times they ought to pray. And not to lose heart. Ephesians 6, 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. When things go well, pray. When things aren't going well, pray. I started listening to Andre Crouch sing when I 
first got saved. I love his song through it all. I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrows. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation God gave blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend upon His Word. God wants you to pray without ceasing. God's will. I can tell you what God's will is for you. Oh, you don't know me. I don't know you, maybe. But I know what God's will is for you. He says right here, God's will for every Christian is to pray continuously. Well, it's God's will for every Christian to rejoice constantly. It's God's will for every Christian to pray continuously. But then it's also God's will, thirdly and finally, for every Christian to give thanks comprehensively. That means thank God for everything. Don't just thank Him for the good. Thank Him for the bad. God can use those tough times to make you more like Christ. So thank Him even for the tough times. In everything, give thanks. Paul was saying, when somebody gets saved, give thanks. When we plant a new church, give thanks. And when we're arrested and thrown into prison for sharing the gospel, well, let's just give thanks. Whatever side of the jail you're on, just give thanks. Gratitude is the pathway out of anxiety. My wife is a reader. She reads all the time. And she showed me an article this week that says, research shows that gratitude, that is being thankful, improves your overall physical and mental health. If you'd stop worrying and replace it with thanksgiving, your mind would be in a better position. Nevertheless, well, he said it increases your resilience to trauma, makes you more productive, but less than half of Americans express gratitude on a regular basis. There's an article, she said, in Psychology Today that says gratitude, this is a quote, reduces a multitude of toxic emotions. I like that phrase, toxic emotions. Well, I can't help my emotions. You can't help the first thought, but you don't have to give it a second thought. The first thought is not on you. That could be a fiery dart from the devil. But the second thought is on you. Don't you give that fearful thought a second thought. You say, well, what do I do? Say, that's not from God. God has not given me a spirit of fear. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus, and I replace it with Scripture. Rejoice in the Lord and always. And again, I say rejoice. I just showed you how to do it. From envy and resentment to frustration and regret, Robert Emons, a leading gratitude researcher, has conducted multiple studies on the link between gratitude and well-being. His research confirms that gratitude, being thankful, that's what we're talking about, gratitude effectively increases happiness and reduces depression. You don't have to stay depressed. You don't have to stay down all the time. Just start thanking God. Well, what am I thanking for? Well, are you breathing? Thank God for air. Thank God for your lungs. Can you see? Thank God that you can see. Can you walk? There's a lot of people that wish they could just get up and go walk somewhere. Have you got any family whatsoever? Thank the Lord for them, even if it's a weird Harold or somebody like that, you know. I, now, if your name's Harold, I don't have you in mind, all right? I just heard that years ago. I won't say that in a second service. Amen, all right. It's one of your weird relatives. How's that? Thank him for that. Shows you how you not, ought not to act, amen? I mean, some people show you how you ought not to act. Just thank God for them. Peter and the apostles were arrested by the Jewish Sanhedrin. 
because they'd preached the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Jerusalem. Jewish leaders were mad. They were ready to kill the apostles. But God sent a man who was a member of the Sanhedrin. Those are the 70 leaders of the Jews named Gamaliel that talked the Jewish council out of killing the apostles. He told them if they're correct, we're going to be fighting against God. And you know what? He was a prophet. They were correct. And the Jews were fighting against God when they tried to kill the Christians. So instead of killing the apostles, they said, let's just have them beaten. And we read this. I'm talking about giving thanks when it's hard. They took his advice, the Sanhedrin did, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them. Now, that doesn't sound much, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but that was a brutal thing. They flogged them, and I'm telling you, there was blood, there was sliced skin, it was horrific. And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council licking their wombs and crying and complaining. No. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's how you're supposed to live right there. We give thanks in the good times and in the bad. Andre's song goes on to sing through it all. So I thank God for the mountains, but I also thank Him for the valleys. Anybody gone through a valley? Anybody gone through a valley? Anybody had a mountaintop? You thank Him both times. And I thank Him for the storms He's brought me through. For if I'd never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in His precious Word could do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend on His Word. No matter what happens in life, in everything, give thanks. When your kids are healthy, give thanks. When they're sick, give thanks. When the money's coming in, give thanks. When more bills are coming in than you have money, give thanks. When your son hits a home run, give thanks. When he wrecks your car, give thanks. When your boss gives you a raise, give thanks. When he makes you stay in later than you want to stay, and he's overbearing, give thanks. Job. God let the devil beat up on Job. Through it all, though. Job praised and worshiped God. He said in Job 1, 21 and 22, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, say it with me now, and the Lord has taken away. Now read the next part. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Say it again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Ephesians 5, 20 says, Always give thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Give thanks comprehensively. Give thanks when all is well. Give thanks when things are tough. It's God's will for every one of us to rejoice constantly. Rejoice always, verse 16. It's God's will for all of us to pray continuously, verse 17, pray without ceasing. And it's God's will for us to give thanks comprehensively in everything. Give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then did you see the next verse? Verse 19. Don't quench 
the Spirit. When you do these things, when you rejoice constantly, pray continuously, give thanks comprehensively, you don't quench the Spirit, you release the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is all over you. People will be convicted of sin, they'll be saved because of the Holy Spirit. People will be baptized, join a Christ-honoring church because of the pulling and the wooing of the Holy Spirit. People will love their spouses, and they'll stay married. Instead of getting out of marriage, when things get tough, they'll stay married because of the power of the Holy Spirit. People will rear godly children who will in turn spread the gospel to their generations. People will reconcile with their enemies because the Spirit of God will be upon them because they rejoice always. They pray without ceasing. In everything they give thanks, this is God's will for them and for you in Christ Jesus. And God says when you do that, you're not going to quench the Holy Spirit. You're going to release the Holy Spirit and your life is going to come alive. Don't you want that? That's what I want. When we get in the will of God, God moves mightily. Well, let's read it one more time. Please read with me from the screen, good and strong, out loud, like you believe it. Make a declaration. Read with me. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's thank the Lord for that beautiful text. Amen. What a beautiful text.